Welcome to the hills. All of you at North Richard Hills, West Fort Worth, and South Lake in person, all of you watching online. We're a church with a vision to ask for nations and generations. One of those goals is to see 15 new churches planted in the next five years. We are a church with a history of starting new churches. Last week, my wife and I got to visit some of those churches. We were in California. We got to be with Lorenzo and Isabel Smith, who lead Collective Church in the heart of L.A. Uh, we got on Sunday to go up to Santa Barbara to be with Mission City Church. You see my wife there in front of the rec center downtown where they meet. It's a beautiful building the city asked the church to meet in. It's actually an old ballroom, as you can tell by the next picture. And the planters are Sean and Jayla Dilbeck, just absolutely lovely people that we got to spend the day with. And then later at the Pepperdine Bible Lectures, I got to hook up with Carlos Isaziga, who plants Salinima City Church in San Diego. And I want you to know, our church planters love the hills. They think we write the book on how to help start churches. They said, you're generous. You send people to check on us. And when your people visit our city, they look us up and they come to church and they take us out to dinner. We love the hills. So I want to thank all of you for being such a gracious church and for supporting that vision. We want to ask for nations. That's why we got such response last week to our opportunity to support brothers and sisters in Ukraine. We want to do it one more week. We have created a seven-day prayer guide. Nations and, nations and generations.org slash Ukraine. Seven days of opportunities to pray. And we've got a tables in the foyer of every campus where you can write notes and prayers. I think we've already got over a thousand that have been written. I hope after this service you'll do that. We're going to take them and send them to our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Now, we're in a series called The Way of King Jesus as we look at the most important sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount. So today I am not going to preach about mothers, but I am going to use several stories about mothers in my sermon, including this one. A mother is getting her teenage daughter ready for her first ever car date. She says, honey, I know boys. He's going to pick you up at the door and he's going to say, my, you look lovely tonight, but I'm not going to worry. He's going to get you in the car and say, you know, you're really special to me. I'm not going to worry. When he takes you out to eat after the meal, he's going to say, let's go out by the lake. We could park and look at the moon shining on the water. I'm not going to worry until you get there and he's going to say, why don't you scoot over here and sit by me? That's when mama's going to start worrying. Do you get it, sweetheart? I got it, mom. She's not back at 10, 11, midnight, not till early in the morning does she come home. Mama, boys are just like you said. He picked me up at the door and he said, my, you look lovely tonight, but I thought of you, mom. I knew you weren't worried. He got me in the car, told me how special I was, but I knew you weren't worried. After supper, he said, you want to go out and drive and we could park at the lake and watch the moon on shine in the water. I knew you weren't worried, but then mom, you know what he did? He said, why don't you scoot over here and sit by me? That's when I thought of you. And I said, why don't you scoot over here and sit by me and let your mom worry? Okay, a classic example of following the rule and completely missing the point. And Jesus made this his main point in his main sermon when he talked about righteousness. See, I think this might be the most important part of the sermon. King Jesus is going to talk about the way to righteousness. And so we come to the heart of the sermon, which is the part of the sermon that's going to focus on the heart. So we're going to read verses 17 through 20 of Matthew 5. Typically, this is a verse that we skip over quickly. I think it is the key to understanding the whole sermon. So look with me, verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear... Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches other accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's a heavy text, and there's two big ideas 
in that text that I think are critical for us to understand. One is that King Jesus has a high view of all Scripture. Now, that's important because Jesus was often accused of not having a high view of Scripture, of dishonoring Scripture, particularly the law of Moses. And Jesus' rebuttal was, I have no problem with any of God's words. I have a big problem with the way you are interpreting God's words. Look again at verse 17. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. You see, Jesus saw part of his mission as following the scriptures, fulfilling the law. He did this by living sinlessly like Moses prescribed. He did this by dying sacrificially like the prophets predicted. Jesus so identified with the scriptures. Now, when I say scriptures, remember, we're talking about what we call the Old Testament. It's the only Bible Jesus had. He so identified with it that to diminish the legitimacy of scripture was to diminish the legitimacy of Jesus. I get nervous when people say, I worship Jesus. I don't worship the Bible. Well, of course we worship Jesus. But if you worship Jesus, you have the same devotion to the scripture that Jesus had. And Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the scripture. Jesus used his Bible all the time. What we call the Old Testament. He used it to authenticate his ministry, to reveal his identity, to rebuke his critics, to legitimize his death, to predict his resurrection. In fact, one chapter earlier, Jesus is out in the wilderness and the devil comes and tempts Jesus. And three times, Jesus overcomes the devil by using scripture that he stored up in his heart. You cannot take seriously the living word if you don't take seriously the written word that meant so much to Jesus. This is why we study the whole Bible at the hills, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus is the key to all of Scripture. And we need all of Scripture to understand and encounter Jesus. Jesus loved his Bible. In fact, it was his love of Scripture that caused him to hate when Scripture got misused. Especially when it was used to follow rules but miss the point. You see, he not only had a high view of all Scripture, but Jesus had a low view of most righteousness. Because the great temptation in religion is to produce a kind of piety that looks good on the outside and is rotten on the inside. You know what I'm talking about. There's a kind of way to do religion where you keep the rules and think, you know, if it's a sin nobody can see, it's not a big deal. I'm just going to focus on the kind of sin that people can see. It's a kind of righteousness that the religious Pharisees and teachers of the law specialized in. And they used the Bible inappropriately to endorse it. It was righteousness that focused on keeping up appearances. It was righteousness as makeup, which reminds me of another mom's story. Uh, a mother wrote in the Reader's Digest, her daughter served in the military. She was stationed at Fort Stewart in Georgia. She was in a leadership course and got sent out into the woods for six weeks to live in very Spartan conditions. She wrote her mother and said, I have met a man that I would really like to get to know better, but we're not allowed to wear makeup, so he has no idea what I really look like. And isn't it true that much religion is just makeup to cover up an impure heart? See, King Jesus is calling for a kind of righteousness that doesn't just follow the rules. He's looking for a kind of righteousness that rules the heart. And he says that's the true purpose of God's words that you keep reading and misusing. And so six times in the heart of the sermon, Jesus is going to say, you have always heard it said, 
But I say to you. Now we're going to look at the first four this week and the next two next week. But here's what's going on. Jesus is going to say, now this is how you have been taught the rule. But I'm going to tell you what God really meant. And before we get there, we have to look one more time at the most startling thing Jesus said. Verse 20. Unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And people gasped. In their minds, the religious teachers and the Pharisees were the epitome of righteousness. They were the poster child. This is what righteousness looks like. And Jesus says, if your righteousness is not better than that, you don't belong in the kingdom of God. And everybody's eyes got big. And everybody's ears opened up. And yours should too. Because we're about to listen as King Jesus says, this is the kind of righteousness God is looking for. So let's read. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you should not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Rika, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taken you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you'll not get out until you've paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, if anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It's been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to people long ago, don't break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you've made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. Either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by earth, for it's the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now that's some heavy stuff. That's some hard preaching. And Jesus has two huge ideas he's unpacking here that we need to look into. And the first is this, that kingdom righteousness calls for deeper obedience. An obedience that goes under the surface. Now, every parent can appreciate this story. A mother's got a three-year-old child in church who's standing in the seat and distracting people. She tells the child to sit down. The child keeps standing. She says again, you need to sit down. The child keeps standing. Mama takes her hand and gently pushes the girl down into the seat. She looks up at her mom, sticks out her bottom lip and says, I'm still standing on the inside. <laughs> and we know that spirit doesn't just live in children. There is a kind of religion that follows the rules, but it never rules the heart. And Jesus is saying God's law was not meant to just be applied externally. Because we live from the heart. In Proverbs 4, it says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And Jesus knows this. Jesus knows makeup can't fix the real problem. 
In Matthew 15, Jesus said, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Here's what Jesus knows. You can put on all the religious makeup you want, but eventually your heart is going to go public. And so what happens when a famous person uses a racial epitaph and it gets recorded? Or they get caught in a financial scandal or some kind of a sexual impropriety? Immediately, the PR and spin doctor goes to work. Oh, that's not the real me. That's not who I really am. Anybody that knows me knows I'm not really like that. And Jesus would respond, no, you are like that. That is the real you. It was in your heart. And what happened is the surface righteousness cracked and the crud that's really there spilled out. I told you this is hard preaching. We don't want to think that's the problem. Jesus says, that's the problem. Think about the most famous murder in the Bible. When Cain killed his brother Abel. Before the murder ever happened, God went to Cain, chapter 4, verse 6 of Genesis. Why are you so angry? The murder was in his heart before it ever got to his hands. What's the most famous case of adultery in the Bible? David and Bathsheba. How would that story get spun today? If King David got caught sleeping with another man's wife. Oh, you know, I'm just all out of sorts because my army's off and I wasn't with them. And just, I just wasn't myself. And besides that, I'm under a lot of stress running the country. And besides that, I'm up on the roof minding my own menace. And this woman is provocatively dressed. Isn't it amazing how men blame women for their sensual problems? Now, here's what David said when he wrote a psalm of confession. 51 verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Because David knew the adultery was in my heart before I ever got in a bed. I'm going to give you an illustration you're not going to forget. Suppose I hold a glass of water. And I shake the glass and water splashes out onto the stage. And I ask you, why did the water fall out onto the stage? You go, duh. Because you shook the glass. That's a true answer. There is a truer answer. Why did the water fall out of the glass? Because water was in the glass in the first place. If there was no water in the glass, I could shake and shake and shake and no water would splash out. And Jesus said, every life is going to have storms. Now, you can build your life on sand or you can build it on the rock. But every life is going to have storms and they're going to shake you. And what's in you is going to come out. And so Jesus says, the kingdom is a place for a deeper kind of obedience. An obedience where the target is more than just not breaking a rule. That the point of the Ten Commandments wasn't just, well, don't commit adultery and don't lie and don't steal. No, it's deeper than that. The point was to become the kind of person that values reconciliation more than alienation. So you go to church and you're really mad at somebody and maybe you have a legitimate reason to be mad, but then you think, you know what? How can I give my gift to the father when I'm mad at one of his kids? So you leave your gift and you go and you make things right with your brother or your sister and then together you come back to the father. That was the point. Be that kind of person. The point was to become the kind of person that would never look at another person as someone to object Defy for your own personal sensual lust and desires. The point was to be the kind of person that so cherished and honored God's gift of marriage that you would never cheapen it or throw it away 
for just any reason. The point was to become a kind of person with so much integrity that you don't have to swear to get people to believe you're telling the truth. You just have to say yes or no because you've become that kind of righteous person. You see, kingdom righteousness goes beyond the minimum requirement. It's a deeper obedience because Jesus wants to have a broader impact. And that's the second big idea. The kingdom righteousness has a deeper obedience and cares about a wider audience. And so all six times when Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say, I'm going to tell you this is what God really meant. All six times he talks about situations that deal with how you deal with other people. Because kingdom righteousness is not just vertical, it's horizontal. That in the kingdom, a righteous heart isn't just focused on how can I be right with God, but how can I be right with the people around me? And so Jesus is challenging makeup righteousness where you can follow the rule and not care that somebody around you is being ignored or diminished. Jesus said, don't you realize, you say, I've never murdered anybody. Yeah, but your anger at them is just a nonviolent way of getting rid of them. It's still the same thing in God's eyes. You say, I've never committed adultery. Don't you understand that when you objectify another person and all you see in them is someone to stimulate your lust, you're robbing them of the dignity God gave them as his image bearer. Jesus said, don't you understand that when you just, for any reason, get divorces, what you're doing is saying other people are disposable. When they don't meet my needs or satisfy my desires anymore, I'll trade them in for somebody else. Jesus says, don't you understand that when people swear and make oaths, what they're basically doing is saying, I'm going to do a cost-benefit analysis of truth. If telling the truth gives me an advantage, then I'll tell the truth. But if I need to massage the truth, if I need to nuance the truth and swear a little bit to get the advantage, I'll do that. Jesus says... You're missing the point. You're keeping the rule and missing the point. Because what is the point of the law of God? Somebody asked Jesus one time, what is the point? And Jesus said, love God with everything you have and love other people. That's the point. The kind of righteousness that impresses the Father is the kind of righteousness that addresses the needs of all of his other children. That's why we write notes and send prayers to brothers and sisters in Ukraine that we'll never see. Not to keep some rule. We don't have to. It's just what righteous people do. That's why next week at our Renew Offering, we're not just going to tithe. We're going to go way past tithing. We're going to be abundantly generous to help 
people in need. Not because there's a rule. That's just what righteous people do. Many of us learn this from our mothers. My mother was the most selfless person in my family. I bet yours was too. Little Jimmy's in math class, teachers teaching fractions. He says, your mom makes a pie, cuts it into five pieces. What percentage of the pie would you get? Jimmy says, one-fourth. No, Jimmy, there's five people in your family. What percentage of the pie would you get? Jimmy says, one-fourth. Teacher says, Jimmy, you don't understand fractions. Jimmy says, teacher, you don't understand my mom. She would say she didn't want any so we could have more. Some of us grew up in a home like that. Jesus did. Jesus grew up in a home that modeled kingdom righteousness, not makeup righteousness. His adopted father was a man named Joseph. And the Bible says that he was a righteous man. Now, that's not just a description. That's an actual title. In those days, a Sadiq was a person recognized in the community as living by the book. Joseph had a reputation. I do everything exactly like the law of Moses says to do it. And then Joseph finds out his fiancee is pregnant. Everybody knows what the rule is. Put her away and publicly disgrace her, Joseph. Protect your reputation. You make sure your reputation as righteous is protected by disgracing and destroying her reputation. That didn't feel right to Joseph. I mean, yeah, that would be keeping the rule, but it didn't feel right. I have to protect myself by destroying her? He's thinking, how could I do it better? How could I, how could I put her away in a way that doesn't ruin her life? And then an angel came to Joseph and said, she's carrying the Son of God. And you marry her. And you adopt that little boy. And you become his earthly father. And Joseph did. And you got to understand. For the rest of Joseph's life. There was insinuation, suspicion, and gossip. Joseph gave up his reputation as a righteous man. No one ever thought Joseph was a righteous man again. Because he didn't keep the rule. But he did get to raise a ruler. Because Joseph had A righteous heart. That's the point. Peter said, love each other deeply from the heart. Because the heart of the matter has always been the matter of the heart. A pastor in Manhattan gets into a cab. The driver has a foul attitude. Anybody, pedestrian or car that gets in the way, gets a severe cursing using the name of the Lord. And finally the pastor says... You shouldn't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And the driver says, preacher, you don't quote that book to me. I went to Sunday school. I know the Bible by heart. And the pastor gently but firmly replied, no, sir. You know the Bible by memory. But you do not know the Bible by heart. I'm not saying follow your heart. The Bible never says follow your heart. It does say follow your heart. Jesus, with all your heart. King Jesus will not settle for a surface obedience. Because King Jesus doesn't want a surface relationship with you. King Jesus wants your heart. All of it. For your own good. King Jesus wants you to know the liberation Of living your life the same person on the inside and the outside. It is absolutely freeing. 
to not always be putting on makeup, to not always be faking and pretending, to just be the same person inside and outside. I'm not saying you're ever going to get it totally together. None of us will. We all need grace. I'm saying that what Jesus wants is a kind of surrender that says, I don't pretend this stuff. I am who I am in the power of the Spirit, inside and outside. I'm following Jesus. He's not at war with your heart. He's at war for your heart. Who do you know like that? Think about it. Who do you know that they're just so authentic, the way they follow Jesus? They're not perfect, but they don't pretend. Who they are on the outside is who they are on the inside. Who do you know like that? I thought since it's Mother's Day, what mom do I know who lived that way? And almost immediately, a person came to my mind, Emma Phelps. Wade and Emma Phelps were rocks in this church. We stand on the shoulders of people like them. Wade was an elder in our church for many years. Emma had polio as a little girl, wore a big brace on her leg all her life, and never once complained about it. And she was a righteous lady. Wade directed a children's home. Sometimes for different reasons, the law wouldn't allow the child to come into the home immediately, and the child had nowhere to go. Wade would just bring him home. He calls Emma. I'm bringing home a girl. She's going to stay with us. I don't know how long. She's going to live with us. And they had four kids, and they had Jenny, uh, at the time about six, who was about the same age and size of this girl. So Emma goes and tells her little daughter, I want you to go into your room, honey. Go into your closet. And I want you to pick out some of your clothes to give to this little girl. Not to loan, to give away. Now, we all know how possessive little kids can be, right? They can have a toy in the closet they haven't touched in years. You let another kid play with it, suddenly it's their favorite toy in the world. (laughs) So Jenny goes into that closet and does what any little kid would do. She found the stuff that was old, the stuff that was unpopular, the stuff she didn't wear anymore, put it all out on the bed. But you see, Jenny had been discipled by her parents. And she got to thinking, you know, if I was a little girl with no clothes, I'd want something nice. So Jenny went back into her closet and she got some of her nicest clothes. And she put them on the bed. What would you have told Jenny? Oh, no, baby, you don't need to give away your nice things. She has nothing. She'll take anything you got and be thankful. Emma walked in and said, Oh, Jenny, I'm so glad that you are giving away some of your nicest clothes. A mother was teaching her daughter that when you follow Jesus, you don't ask, what's the least I can do to keep a rule? What's the best I can do? To love a person. Who taught you that? If a face comes to mind, I hope you'll say thank you very soon. And even better, I hope you will take it to heart. So let's pray. So, dear God, please anoint and water this teaching. Give us ears to hear it, hearts to receive it, and wills to do something with it. Because we don't want to just look good. We want to be good. For Jesus' sake. And we pray in his name. Amen.